Hello to everybody. Uh, you are your consciousness. It's what you got. Without the ex capacity to experience life, there's really nothing. Now, experiences tend to come in, in two different shades, either good or bad, or pleasure or pain. And if they are good, you are happy. Otherwise, you are miserable. And my point is that by understanding what this is all about, we may be able to squeeze the brain into giving us more of the good things in life. So I'll try to coach you through what I, my understanding of the brain. And my first question then is, who can be happy? And the rose is ruled out because plants don't have any nervous system, which is required for feeling anything. Uh, primitive animals are, have nervous system, like this round worm, but it's very small. It's like a few hundred neur neurons large, and it's not sufficient to create happiness. So that means that this capacity we have evolved sometime in between we split off with these primitive animals and the present humans, which can be happy. Uh, another question we can ask, ask is who is successful? And success in biology means having lots of progeny or having lots of biomass for a species. And at least the rose is doing fine because people like to have it in the garden. The roundworms are doing great because they're all over, you just don't see them. And the bad news is that humans are doing great too. And in fact, we're doing so great that we are about to ruin this planet. <laughs> so my point then is that we should not try to opt for more biological success, but we should opt for more happiness. And the good news is that happiness is a very sustainable commodity. So we start with the nervous system. It was generated by evolution for the purpose of orchestrating behavior. And behavior generally means just moving the body somewhere. So all nervous systems are kind of built on the same type. They have a sensory cell that they react to something in the environment, and then a processing unit, and then an effector cell that attach the muscles and start the movement. So why move? And there's just two very simple answers why an animal should need to move. The one is to avoid what is bad from the genes, and the other is to move towards what is good from the genes, like this little roundworm is doing now. And what evolution did, this was a great idea by evolution, it was a very success to create a nervous system. So what evolution did eventually was to expand on the processing unit of the nervous system. And it did so particularly in three lines of animal, or three groups of animals in the anthropods and the mollusks and the vertebrates. The thing is that the, and it did it because by improving the processing, it created more advanced form of behavior, more ways of responding to the environment. And in one of these groups, evolution hit a very peculiar idea at some point. Starting about 300 million years ago, it devised feelings. And basically it means that bad feelings are there for you to move away from something. Good feelings are there for you to move towards something which is the basic dichotomy of any kind of behavior. And uh, the fact that we can be happy is just some accidental byproduct of this fluke of evolution. So we, we're not quite sure when it started, but it's reasons to suggest it did start with the amniotes some 300 million years ago, which are the, uh, the shared ancestors of reptiles, birds, and mammals. And the thing about feelings is to for the feelings to make any sense, you need to feel them. And feeling them means you need some sort of awareness. And this awareness, I think, is what formed consciousness or evolved into consciousness. Of course, the human form of consciousness has evolved a lot since the early reptiles. We have lots of fancy functions like self-awareness and cognition and so on. But basically, it's the same. It's about the, the, the requirement to be able to tune into feelings. And uh, then, but then again, consciousness is really is just kind of ripples on the ocean of brain activity. It's not it's not a great thing at all. It's just one thing app the evolution put into the the our brain, and most of the activity in the brain are unconscious. And the thing is, the conscious part is it's like information is only given on a need to know basis because consciousness is expensive for the brain. It is slow, very slow, compared to unconscious decisions. And it is, uh, can only deal with one thing at the moment. You may think you can do two things, but then you just jump between the two things. 
So consciousness is uh, is there for special purposes and should not just it's not required for other things. So when I try to explain how the brain works, I like to use the concept of brain modules. And for me, brain modules is just the functions, evolutions added to the brain for the species to survive. And I used to like to, sort of to kind of compare that with this fancy pocket knife with all sorts of nice functions in it. I guess had I been younger, I probably would have compared it to the iPhone with all sorts of apps in it. It's the same thing. Of course, the brain is not as well organized as these things but it has the same you know, purpose to it, that evolution added all sorts of, of functions for us to survive, including then feelings and consciousness. And the main, the most important modules for this talk is what I refer to as the mood modules. They are the ones that give you the good or the bad in feelings. So now, when you do have emotions of any sort, it's generally based on two types of modules in the brain you have this one type of modules that generate the positive or negative aspects of the feelings and this totally different kind of modules that actually add a flavor meaning that if you have uh, friendship and eating chocolate they both activate to get a good mood the reward part of the brain which is this we know is the same part of the brain actually while they of course they feel very different because there's a different flavor to it and the same with if you are like being rejected or feel physical pain the uh, bad part of the feeling is the same module, pretty much. So that makes it kind of easier to know what, or just one thing first, in order to, uh, it's kind of nice, evolution is not really caring, doesn't really care about you at all, but it, you happen to, it happened to install you with a brain that by default is giving you positive sensations, positive feelings, pr simply just because it is in the gene's interest to reside within a body that has a positive and optimistic attitude to life. So if everything is fine, you feel good, you are happy. And you can see that in both humans and animals, the same for other mammals. Uh, the problem, of course, it is that everything is not always that great. Sometimes things are not good. And the problem in modern society is that we have this problem with the punishment module of the brain. and. Too many people are bothered by that. And the one issue about this punishment module that gives you the bad feeling is that it has a very low threshold because it's so much more important for your genes that you run if you see a snake or run if you see a lion than that you stop and pick up this apple. The apple will be around tomorrow, but you will be dead unless you react to the dangers. So punishment feelings have a low uh, threshold. And they're also subconsciously triggered because you're not, you should not be allowed to turn them off. That just would uh, endanger your genes. So you cannot easily turn them off. They should be there. It's like if you stand on top of a cliff, you should be afraid because otherwise your genes will be dead in the next second. So the problem in my society, in my country, and in most Western countries, is that we are bothered by hyperactivity or uh, unnecessary activity in certain types of punishment modules, and that is particularly those concerned with physical pain, with fear, or with low mood. And when we see that is in, in a diagnostic setting, we call it either chronic pain, or anxiety, or depression. And that's a big problem. It's, it it's affects diagnostically like close to half of the population during a lifespan. And 10 to 20% every year has a diagnosable depression or anxiety disorder. This is a big problem, and it's why, although my country supposedly is very happy, I don't think we are that happy in Norway. So then, the question of how to improve happiness is very easy in this respect. It's just to kind of reduce the activity in the punishment module, and you can add that you can also kind of try to increase the activity in remote reward modules. But I think where the shoe pinches for most people in Western country is that the punishment module is kind of too active. So, so far that would be easy. The problem, of course, is that these modules are more or less controlled by your subconscious or unconscious brain, so you're not, they're not easily accessed by you. But you do, however, have some options. You can exercise, and I know everybody knows that you can exercise your muscles and grow big biceps if you just push enough iron. Like this woman got two gold medals now in the Olympics after pushing a lot of iron. You can also 
exercise your brain modules. Brain modules that are activated often will grow and be more active and then deliver more content for your consciousness. So, back to this kind of analogy of consciousness being the surface on the ocean of subconsciousness. Then the, what forms your conscious experiences are like bubbles rising up from these deeper waters and then fusing on the top to kind of create one immediate unified experience of life. I mean, your experience is unified. You don't, you cannot, if you see an orange, you cannot say, I want, only want to see the shape, not the color. I only want to feel the texture and not smell the uh, orange flavor. So it's getting to a unified surface layer with the bubbles, and some bubbles never reach there. This, the subconscious kind of generate all sorts of starting uh, input to your conscious experiences. Some reach the surface, some do not. And then if I add to this, then the picture including these brain modules here in nice colored circles, uh, you can see that some modules are kind of high up or close to the surface, others are deeper down, and some are big, delivering lots of content to the conscious experiences. Others are smaller and having less impact on your daily life. But the point and the kind of surprising thing is that even from your spot here up at the surface of the waters, you're, it's possible to access or at least to impact on most of these modules that are in the unconscious brain. And uh, it's particularly possible if we have a way of measuring the content if you can measure what's going on there, you can learn by biofeedback training to impact on it. Uh, for example, uh, with the heart rate, if you can monitor the heart rate and give biofeedback signal back to the person, you can learn to change your heartbeat, which is not in the kind of evolutionary interest because the genes certainly don't, does not want you to stop the heartbeat. It's kind of put that out of some conscious activity because it should be going on automatically. So the kind of exercise that I uh, like to promote is first starting with trying to calming down what's going on in the brain. And I do that with sorts of meditative techniques. And doing so, I mean calming the, the activity in the brain, also to some extent means turning off the punishment feelings and the punishment modules. So we are, if you can manage to go there from here, you already have a more pleasant brain to deal with, and it also means that you learn to kind of control it, you learn to tune things down a bit. Then added to that, however, once in this kind of calm down state, you can try to focus on certain of these subconscious modules that you think are not that good. For example, many people suffer from anxiety due to that this fear module has grown too big, and these modules, they come with kind of on and off switches. So what happens then if you exercise the on switch a lot, like you always get uh, worked up by the stress of job, by the stress of uh, affairs in life and by so on, you will kind of exercise the on button and the whole anxiety module will grow and you will have a lower threshold for feeling anxiety or fear or any sort of, that sort of negative feelings. And it doesn't feel very good because they are meant to be bad. It's meant to be a punishment element to this. So what you can do then is try to exercise the off switch instead. And that's kind of tricky because it's in the subconscious part of the brain, but it's possible. And we know, as I said before, it's, it seems to be possible to reach out and touch on most of these modules in the brain. And you can do that, for example, by, uh, by using words, by using imagery, and even by using certain muscles. For example, it's been shown that if you force your mouth into a smile without really smiling, that's enough to send signals back into the brain saying, oh yeah, this person is happy because he's smiling and that impacts on your mood. And in the same way, if you just say to yourself, oh, I'm happy, I'm happy, then eventually it has a small impact on your brain and it, hap it does exercise your positive re reward model part. And similarly with imagery, I have a colleague in Oslo who showed that the, uh, you know, the uh, pupils of the eyes, they're supposed to expand in darkness and contract in light. And that's, of course, it's a reflex thing. But given that these people can actually change the size of the pupils just by thinking about something dark or thinking about something light. And this means it's possible to impact on um, modules that are really meant to be completely like just a reflex pattern in the brain. 
the trick is then to find ways to to do that and for what we would want to have and we're kind of getting there is kind of measurement how to measure the activity in the anxiety module how to measure the activity in the off button for that and that's uh, we people are starting to work on that uh, like with things like brain scans or electrodes on the brain measuring brain activity in those ways still that's not practical for for biofeedback training but it is possible to use meditative techniques and then to add in as your mantra or in your sentences words like i feel good or words like i don't worry there's nothing to worry about i feel happy and use those while in a meditative state to kind of push small buttons on these modules to exercise them and i think that has a potential i think it's possible to go that way so for the future i kind of see that we'll have both apps for happiness exercise actually we designed one that's ho hopefully will be out for iphone pretty soon and also kind of brain gyms where you not just do the running but you can also hook up with these biofeedback machines that can you say ah oh, today i'll train the off button for my anxiety problem or i'll train just to be elevating my mood a little bit and that sort of thing and i think in some time sometime in the future we will have that and the nice thing about having that is that then happiness is really a quite cheap commodity people can exercise themselves to a good life and i don't I'm not going to need all these other artifacts and things they spend their money on. And people can even be happy whatever circumstances they are in. This is a tradition dating back to like the, the, the monks of the Buddhist order, particularly in Tibet, use this sort of happiness exercises to some extent. And they claim they can be happy in a single cell in, in Lhasa even, just by exercising the brain. So I think it's possible. And I wish you good luck with the exercises. So thank you.